space ghosts, time loops, daddy issues. There's a lot of things that can make a sci-fi movie difficult to follow. It goes without saying that Stanley Kubrick's 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey is one of the greatest achievements in cinematic history. It's one of the few classic films that is as awe-inspiring today as it was during its initial release. One of the best things about the movie is its ambiguity. Over five decades have passed since the film was first screened, and fans are still debating what the monolith, the Star Child, and the Stargate represent. The film ends with one of the most dazzling sequences in sci-fi history. After dismantling the artificial intelligence HAL 9000 on the Discovery spacecraft, astronaut Dave Bowman flies a pod into the mysterious Stargate. Bowman's vision is warped as he ventures into the unknown and watches strange bright colors that he can't comprehend. Once that's over, Bowman awakens in a bedroom, where he encounters several older versions of himself. Is this part of Dave's memory? Why does he touch the monolith? What exactly is the Star Child? Kubrick was notoriously tight-lipped about his intentions, although he did reveal in one interview that he considers the monolith to be a tool in evolution. I don't suppose you have any idea what the damn thing is, huh? <laughs> I wish the hell we did. James Gray's 2019 science fiction film Ad Astra is a quiet, intimate character study about a man's strained relationship with his father. Viewers that were expecting a fast-paced action spectacle may have been disappointed, but for those who are interested in a more thoughtful depiction of masculinity, Ad Astra is deeply profound. The movie takes place in the late 21st century, where space travel has advanced under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Space Command program. Astronaut Major Roy McBride is recovering from trauma after nearly losing his life during a mission outside Earth's atmosphere. Despite his intense profession, Roy has closed himself off to emotions. Spacecom offers to send Roy into deep space to find his father Clifford, an astronaut who disappeared during a mission to find intelligent life. After Roy finds his father and brings him to the spaceship Cepheus, Clifford begs for his son to let him go. Heartbroken, Roy allows his father to drift away into the unknown. However, during the film's final moments, Roy's spirits seem to have improved. Why is Roy feeling better, even though his mission ended in failure? It's possible that he has learned how to allow himself to really heal for the first time. Blade Runner is renowned as one of the most confusing science fiction movies ever, and it's not hard to see why. The production of the 1982 film was notoriously troubled, and after a series of initial test screenings, preview audiences felt that the rough cut was far too bleak. Warner Brothers decided to re-edit the film to give it a happy ending, so Harrison Ford was brought back in to record a voiceover that would make the story less ambiguous. The narration ended up being one of Ford's least enthusiastic performances to date. I'd quit because I'd had a belly full of killing. But then I'd rather be a killer than a victim. Different endings of Blade Runner were released after its disappointing initial run. Ridley Scott's 1992 director's cut removed the voiceovers and included new footage of Rick Deckard dreaming of unicorns. The unicorn seemed to suggest that Deckard is a replicant, a theory that Scott himself believes. However, Ford disagrees with Scott's interpretation. He said that the beauty of Blade Runner comes from watching a human man learn about humanity from an artificial woman. If Deckard was also a replicant, that symbolism would be lost. Unfortunately for anyone hoping for clarification, the sequel, Blade Runner 2049, fails to provide an answer to the questions left by the original. Prometheus took the alien universe in a bold new direction. While many elements of the story are familiar to fans of the earlier films, Prometheus examines more philosophical themes than its predecessors. Ridley Scott explores mankind's search for its creator through the eyes of sentient android David, as he begins to develop his own consciousness. The ending of the movie is even more confusing a decade later, as the 2017 sequel Alien Covenant did its best to retcon it. To say that Prometheus was divisive would be an understatement. Some Alien fans appreciated the film's boldness, but others found it dull and cliché. Initially, Scott had wanted this prequel series to subvert the fans' expectations, but the director seems to have changed his opinion following the intense negative reactions to the 2012 film. Although Scott had originally planned to continue the story of Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, Alien Covenant reveals that she died off-screen, with only a few hints about her fate. As a result, the ending of Prometheus feels anticlimactic. What will Shaw's next adventure be? Unfortunately, it seems that audiences will never know. 
Sci-fi fans who haven't seen Southland Tales are missing out on one of the wildest movies of the 21st century. This epic Los Angeles crime saga had a notoriously troubled road to release, as it was rushed to completion in order to screen at the Cannes Film Festival in 2006. Unfortunately, the Cannes response was overwhelmingly negative, and the film was edited down before its limited theatrical release. The Southland Tales takes place in an alternate version of 2008, where the American political state is more fragmented than ever before. The Patriot Act has enabled the government to spy on civilians as they please, but a neo-Marxist revolution has emerged in Los Angeles. The fates of Hollywood action star Boxer Santeros, adult film actress Krista Now, and police officer Roland Taverner all become intertwined as the end of the world inches ever closer. Scientists are saying the future is going to be far more futuristic than they originally predicted. Despite its two-and-a-half-hour runtime, Southland Tales still felt incomplete, which it was. Writer-director Richard Kelly fleshed out the narrative with his 2007 comic book, Southland Tales The Prequel Saga, which helps explain the character's motivations. In 2021, Kelly released his director's cut, which finally gave viewers some clarity on his intentions with the film. Duncan Jones' 2011 film Source Code is a sci-fi twist on the Groundhog Day premise. Former soldier Coulter Stevens wakes up on a Chicago commuter train in the body of schoolteacher Sean Fentress. He discovers that his consciousness has been inserted into a dead man's memory via a technology called source code. Stevens is reliving the eight minutes before the train exploded, and he has to play through the simulation over and over again to discover the bomber's identity. Stevens ultimately solves the mystery and passes the information along to the program's manager, Captain Colleen Goodwin. Still, Stevens asks Goodwin to let him experience the simulation one more time. After eight minutes elapse and the attack is foiled, time in the artificial world continues to move forward. Now living as Fentress with his physical body dead, Stevens goes on a date with the simulated woman he fell in love with, suggesting that he has chosen to exist in an alternate reality created by the source code program. It's left unclear what Stevens' future might look like within this parallel timeline, or how many layers deep it really goes. The Star Trek film franchise got off to an unusual start. Star Trek The Motion Picture wasn't an action-packed epic at all. In fact, the film's morose tone and spiritual themes put it in sharp contrast with the Star Trek TV series. While the original show certainly had its philosophical undertones, it was also plenty of fun. Meanwhile, the motion picture felt closer to something like 2001 A Space Odyssey than the campy adventure Trek fans might have expected. Unlike most modern blockbusters, the movie didn't end with a direct tie-in to an upcoming sequel either. After the Enterprise reaches an energy cloud in deep space, the crew discovers that the V'ger entity they've been searching for was once known as Voyager 6. The probe was created by mankind in the 20th century, but had become lost in deep space since its launch. Our heroes are left to ponder what lessons the failed mission can teach them. Feature expects an answer. An answer? I don't know the question. The confusion comes as the story wraps up. Kirk's new first officer, Willard Decker, decides he doesn't want to leave the robotic replica V'ger made of his former love, Ilea, which still houses her memories and feelings. Decker chooses to merge with both the Ilea replica and V'ger, creating a completely different life form. This enigmatic creation's future was left unexplored in the many subsequent Star Trek films, leaving a number of longtime Trekkies bewildered and a little disappointed. Although its sci-fi premise is obviously fictitious, District 9 is an insightful film about apartheid and immigration. Neil Blumkamp's feature debut takes place in an alternate South Africa, where an alien transport ship has arrived on Earth above Johannesburg. The South African government relocates the extraterrestrial immigrants, referred to as prawns, to a zone known as District 9. District 9 follows government employee Vikas van der Merva, who slowly transforms into a prawn after becoming infected by an alien fluid. Thanks to his change in perspective, Vikas decides to help single prawn father Christopher Johnson return to his spaceship, and ultimately, home. At the end of the film, Christopher and his son CJ manage to reach the mothership but Vickis's fate is unclear. Viewers still don't know if Christopher will return to save him or if he will simply go back to his home planet. Blomkamp has said that he is considering a potential sequel, unsurprisingly called District 10. Steven Soderbergh's 2002 space film Solaris didn't exactly go over well with audiences when it was first released. 
In fact, it's one of the few films in history that earned an F cinema score from audience polls. Solaris was saddled with weighty expectations. The film adapts Stanislav Lem's novel, which also inspired the beloved 1972 film by Andrei Tarkovsky. Each film benefits from heavy analysis, as both versions are very disorienting after just one viewing. Soderbergh's Solaris ends after Dr. Chris Kelvin realizes that he did not actually return to Earth after his mission into deep space. A flashback reveals that Kelvin decided to stay on the doomed space station with the apparition of his deceased wife, Rhea. When Kelvin asks her if he is still alive, she has a cryptic answer ready for him. We don't have to think like that anymore. Perhaps Kelvin is having a dream in the moments before his death, or maybe he and Rhea are in some sort of afterlife. Either way, audiences have spent the last two decades unsure. Anyone who's concerned about the rise of artificial intelligence may want to steer clear of Ex Machina, if they like to sleep at night. Alex Garland's feature-length directorial debut makes some bold and frightening predictions about synthetic life. The cerebral sci-fi thriller takes place in the secluded luxury estate of the wealthy CEO Nathan Bateman. Nathan invites an employee, Caleb Smith, to be the human component within a Turing test for his AI robot, Ava. Ava demonstrates an independent consciousness through her interactions with Caleb. However, they soon learn that they were both part of an elaborate test designed by Nathan, and that the CEO is planning on wiping her memories and starting fresh. This infuriates Ava, who attacks Nathan and leaves him for dead. Both Ava and Caleb's fates are left up to the viewer's interpretation. Ava escapes, stealing lifelike skin so that she can infiltrate society, leaving Caleb to die as well. While Ava's true intentions throughout the film are unclear, what is clear is that she's learned that she can only trust herself. If you thought that Alex Garland's first film as a director was confusing, just wait until you see his second. Garland's Annihilation is a melting pot of different sci-fi influences. Based on Jeff Vandermeer's novel of the same name, Annihilation starts off as a fairly straightforward mystery, as biologist Lena accompanies a group of scientists into a strange biological anomaly called the Shimmer. Things only get weirder from there. The final sequence of Annihilation is absolutely jaw-dropping. After discovering the body of her husband Kane, Lena travels through a cavernous tunnel filled with unexplained phenomena. She even dances with her own doppelganger and seems to take it down with a grenade. When Lena returns to the government base, a man identical to her husband tells her that he is not Kane, but has retained some of his memories. Does that mean Lena's doppelganger escaped and the real Lena is still in the shimmer? It's a debate for the ages.